Hi, my name is Mike Dillard, and this is a Self Made Man, the podcast for those who want to leave their mark on the world and create a legacy of honor, integrity, and achievement in every aspect of your life. I'm glad you're here, and once again, it is time to forge your destiny. By the time Susie Batiz was 38, she had filed for bankruptcy for the second time in her life. Her cars were repossessed, she lost her business, and she was broken in every way that you could imagine. So she went on a journey to examine her life in an attempt to find out why she was constantly struggling with business, with money, and with her relationships. Well, what she discovered and what you're going to learn about here today changed everything. Within a few years, she started a little company called Poopery, and yes, Poopery is exactly what it sounds like, a new way to handle unwanted odors in your bathroom. Well, today they've done over $400 million in sales, and her life has completely changed in every way that you can imagine. So what happened? What did Susie learn that allowed her to turn a life of struggle into a life of abundance and success? Well, I'll just say this. The answer is very surprising. You are in for one hell of a story today that you will not want to miss. So please help me welcome Susie Batiz. Susie Batiz, welcome to the Self Made Man podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. Oh, hi, Mike. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. I'm excited. I, um, it's really cool to see that you're my neighbor up to the north, straight up I 35. Love Dallas. Yes. Yeah. I love Austin. Do you, yeah. have, uh, do you ever make it down to town for any, any specific events that we have, ACL or F1 or any of that good stuff? I do. I'm going to be uh, on a panel at South by Southwest in a couple of weeks, right? Um, okay. Is that coming up? Yeah. Gosh, yeah, that is coming up. I think up. it's in March. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. I'm excited. I, I love Austin. I love the vibe and the groove and tried to get my kids to move there early on, but they wouldn't. I think they regret it now. Yeah, I'm, I've lived in Dallas for a while in San Antonio, Houston for a little bit a long time ago, and I, it's just hard to beat Austin if you're going to live in Texas. So I know you're a Texas boy. That's yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I've really loved getting to learn more about your story and your history, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna dive into any of that because I would love it if you could uh, share that with our audience here today. But you've had a hell of a ride as an entrepreneur uh, during your career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I have. <laughs> let's, if you could, let's start it at at the beginning with bankruptcy number one. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, can you believe that? <laughs> um, yeah. So the, you know, the fun thing is, is I've always been, I've always been a natural kind of a maker per se. When I was eighteen, I designed this pair of denim shoes, and I called guests in New York, and I said, you know, I designed this pair of shoes. They're denim pumps so that you don't have to, you know, have different color denim shoes and, you know, different color pumps. And they said, get up here because we're coming up with a shoe line. And I go home, and my mom says, oh, you can't go to, to New York. Like, you're just a little girl from Arkansas. They'll chew you up and spit you out. So I never went, of course. And then guess what? Two years later, a guest came out with a denim pump. But that just, you know, I've, I've always been a maker. So when I was 19, I decided, well, if I can't do that, I can buy a bridal salon in, in the small town of Arkansas, right? I bought a bunch of old inventory and I didn't even make it, I don't think, a year because there was nothing really sellable in the store, maybe, you know, two or three gowns. And I was just so naive. So I ended up filing bankruptcy, I think, a year and a half later. And I was like 19 years old. <laughs> yeah. I always tell people, it's like, you know those rodeo riders that when they open the the gate and then they they, they fall right as the gate opens? Yeah. Like, yeah, that was me. And yeah. you kind of go, oh, they didn't even get the ride. <laughs> well, I got to ask you, I mean, that's a drastic, a drastic measure to take that has a significant impact on you for years after that, you know, credit line wise and getting mm. a, a home loan or a car, you know, loan and all of that stuff. How did that affect you? It affected me a lot, of course, for many years, you know, um, most of my life. Um, what's interesting is that I didn't know any other way out. Mm. And, um, you know, as, I, as I'm older, I've definitely, as Marie calls it, you know, and I called it even before I met Marie, the figure outer muscle, my figure outer muscle is a lot, a lot better. But yeah, so I, I filed bankruptcy. It affected me for a long time. I tried to kill myself when I was 21. Because I just didn't know how to do life, right? I, I'd had kind of a, not kind of, but I had a just dis, really dysfunctional childhood with, you know, molestation and abuse and mm. those things. 
And I just didn't feel like I could make it. And when I was 23, I became pregnant with my first son. And that really kind of gave me a reason to live. And then I was in abusive marriage for about four years <laughs> and got out of that, did a sleeping with the enemy type situation, got out of that. And it seemed like I was always, I was always like selling stuff out of the trunk of my car. Whenever I had a job, I always had some side hustle. And the whole point, Mike, was that I thought that money was going to get me out. So whenever I couldn't make money, I thought money was my ticket out. And, and I just always, so I strove for it my entire life and made a lot of really, really not great choices you know, really pursued ideas that didn't turn me on, but it just made sense. Like, oh, hold on. You know, I tell my um, husband at the time, my third husband, like, you know what, you know, you know, electrical stuff, we can fix tanning beds. I think you can make money fixing tanning beds. So I put flyers up everywhere and, you know, do tanning beds. And I'd had a clothing salon with my, with my second husband. I mean, yeah, clothing salon. I found this brochure. So I sent my, my third husband into strip joints to sell lingerie because I knew I, could, I knew I could mark it up like five, six hundred percent. And he would come back with a bunch of cash. And that was awesome, you know, like 600 bucks. But back then, that was a lot of money. And but I always, always was scheming to, to make money so I could get myself out because I knew if I could make enough money that somehow I was going to be happy. And I continued on this path for many, many years. Um, you know, I've sold truckloads of gearboxes and fabric. I've, I've made clothes and decorated them, sold them out of the trunk of my car to beauty salons. Like when I tell you, I was, I was always having, you know, making things, buying things and selling them at garage sales, you know, buying computers for $100, selling them for 300 at garage sales. So I was a hustler beyond a hustler, but I was hustling for what I thought something that was going to get me out. And I always tell people, you know how, I don't know if you've ever been skiing or seen someone ski and then they fall kind of at the top of a really big mountain and they, they just continue falling. They can't quite stop. Mm. That's the way I was. I was on this really rapid, because of my desperation, I was on this rapid kind of downhill slope. So none of my businesses really worked. Um, they would be a little bit successful. You know, I'd make a little bit of money here and there. And the final straw came when I was the vice president of a recruiting firm. I, you know, I, I had a career in recruiting and really started making real money for the first time in my life. And I thought, you know, what needs to happen is um, there needs to be a website where a person's culture is matched to a company's culture. And this was in 1999. So way ahead of the curve. It was like 20 years, you know, too early. And I, um, I, I just said that this is what needs to happen. So I created this concept called Greener Grass, um, was talking to, um, you know, investment bankers and people, um, VC firms. And I was in the final stages of getting $5 million in funding. I had psychologists on board. Everybody thought it was a fantastic idea. And it is. But of course, the whole plan was built on when, it, do you remember when people thought that if views actually equaled income, equaled money? Right. So that whole concept was built on that. And then the stock market crashed in uh, 2001. I had you know, leveraged everything I had, you know, our house, our cars, and uh, really put everything I had into this concept. And it all just came tumbling down. Mm. It was really, I was 38 years old, and it was beyond devastating. I, you know, everything that I, I it's like I, I almost had it. You know, I almost had that taste of what I thought was going to bring me happiness. I get a little teary right now thinking about it because my desperation was so, I was so close to finally being happy because I equated money with happiness. Right. And yeah, that was when I was 38 and it was a, that was a hell of a ride. Um, I remember you've shared some details around, around that experience that were pretty, uh, pretty tough to listen to and pretty, <laughs> pretty difficult to go through. Um, specifically, the one I remember is when you heard a, a specific noise outside of your bedroom window one morning. Oh, uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was the moment of awakening when I heard the, um, the crane, you know, the, the wrench was a winch, like, like outside of my bedroom. And it was in that split second 
you know, like I've lived on hope, 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 hope. I'm going to pull it together. I'm going to, I'm going to pull it, you know, it's like not, not facing reality. Like I'm in a real, you know, crap hole here. And I remember that sound and I went out to, to my backyard, the driveways are in the back here in Dallas. And I saw them pulling away my car. And I'll just never forget that sound because that was the moment of, oh, my God, like I get teary right now thinking about it. Like my deepest fears are really happening. Like it's it's really happening. Like everything is now going. And then they took, you know, one car and, the you know, I do the typical I'm in my bathrobe and I run out and jump in there trying to get myself out of the you know, glove box pleading to the to the guy that's repossessing it. And uh, then it was the next car, you know, a, a couple of weeks later. And then, you know, eventually the house. And, ah, uh, man, I, I think what's worse was having to really face my family. I lied to them. Um, I lied to my children. My husband knew. I lied to my children and told them that we need to move to another school. And I've often said, and you may have saw it in a couple of my talks, that, you know, you know you're at a really bad place when you have to lie to the people that love you unconditionally. Like, that's where I was, you know. Mm -hmm. I, like I said, I get teary just thinking about it again. It's like, man, you know, these were my kids and I can't tell them the truth. So they had no idea that any of this happened for many years. So we sweep them up. I move. And what I realized is I wasn't just financially bankrupt. that I was spiritually bankrupt. And I went to a hypnotherapist and, uh, and I told him what went on. And he, he told me, he said, you know, your problem is you have no meaning in your life. I said, what are you talking about? Like, I have meaning. I have kids. And he gave me the book from Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. And that was the impetus for me finally looking inside myself and addressing a lot of that unhappiness that I had that I actually thought, which is such a, a rogue play. Like it was just a, I was duping myself to think that money was going to give me that. And that became the, the beginning of kind of a, a, what was a four year really intense spiritual search. You know, there's a couple of things that come to mind. I know I had to learn it in my earlier years as an entrepreneur, but uh, I summed it up as the faster you chase after money, the faster it runs away from you, <laughs> um, as with most, most things in life. <laughs> so um, that was really interesting to hear you have a similar experience. And on the, on the spiritual journey, side of things. You've talked about that in a bunch of the speeches that you've given on how you learn to identify the right decisions to make in life, whether it's in life or business or relationships or whatever it may be. But you essentially generated an awareness that's allowed you to transform your decision-making process. Can you dive into that? Yeah. So what happened was, is I'm, you know, I, I of course started an interior design business, right? you know, I just can't help making and starting businesses. So I was doing that a little bit on the side. I was making a lot of money, so I didn't have to work that many hours. But I was really going to kind of spiritual workshops and looking inside myself. And I was happy and at peace for the first time in my life. I really released my attachment, that desperate desire for money. And I was like, I just need enough to live on, like literally live, like to just eat, Right pay my, you know, we lived in a very modest home. And I was like, this is it. Like, I'm happy. I'm finally happy. And then all of a sudden, I have this, um, I'm at a dinner party. And my brother in law asked if bathroom odor can be trapped. And I my hobby was essential oils. And I remember like having like this body sensation, like a zing up my arm. And I, I just really I became really awake and aware my energy lifted and I said, I can do that with oil. Like I just knew I could do that. It took me about nine months, you know, really intense formulating. And um, one day my husband, you know, walks out of the bathroom and says, oh my God, we're going to be millionaires. So it actually worked. But what was fascinating is the way I ran my business, I never wanted to be in business. It's just, I happened to birth this thing that really works. So I just bought a thousand bottles 
you know, really just step by step. I built a little website. I had a friend that said, I have a store. Will you sell to my store? I doubled my prices so I could have them for wholesale. I get, I literally just step by step started going really innocently. Again, never because I had sworn off being in business because I believe that business, what was creating me was creating the unhappiness in me. It wasn't, you know, business and money. I didn't want anything to do with it. But what do you do when you come up with something that's so fantastic? I am a natural sharer. I wanted to share it. And I continued doing that. And what I've done is because I, because I had the luxury, what I call the luxury of losing everything, I was determined when I came back into business that I wasn't going to do anything that what I call didn't turn me on, right? I, if it didn't feel good, I wasn't going to do it. Because I often say what's worse than losing everything is losing everything and realizing you didn't even have a good time, right? Yeah. So my, my goal was I'm going to have a good time, okay? And it's going to feel good. My employees, for 13 years, I've had the business. I've told them when it's not fun anymore, I'm out of here. Like literally, if I'm not enjoying myself, you should do the same, right? We should all be doing what turns us on. And I've always been a huge preacher for that. What I didn't understand until a few years ago, maybe about five years ago, that actually was the secret to my success. And I had a phone call with a, um, with a cellular um, biologist and I called him and said, our idea is alive. And he said, why do you ask? And I said, I have this theory that the ideas I follow that seem alive are more resilient and they seem to work out. And the ones that I just create with my logical mind don't seem to be as successful for me. And he explained to me about resonance and dissonance. And resonance is when you put two energy patterns together that are alike, they're traveling at the same speed and the same wavelength together, they create more energy together than they do apart. And dissonance is the opposite. When you put two energy waves together, they're at a different vibration. Um, it actually creates less energy than they do together. I was like, oh my gosh. That's exactly what happened. Like I knew that me with the idea of poopery created more energy than I had alone. Me with the viral video campaign created more energy than I did alone. So I just started noticing that and I put together what I call the four signs of resonance. And one of them is a body sensation. You know how you'll be talking to people and they'll say, oh my gosh, I have chill bumps. You know, that to me is this one sign of resonance. The other is I have increased energy. I feel alive. You know, it's like I don't, I can research all night long, you know, with an idea. I'm super excited about it. The third is the idea keeps coming back around. Like it won't leave me alone. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm doing a big scary project right now that I've had this idea for five years. I um, mean, it just won't go away. So I'm going to. I'm finally doing it. And the fourth one is synchronicity. It's kind of like I'm always sitting next to the person on the plane, you know, that I happen to need to meet. And people call it Susie's world, but I don't believe it's Susie's world. I believe it's just a, literally it's a, it's a vibration that you carry when you are doing things that feel alive. Yeah, agreed. It's, it's always an amazing feeling when you have that idea and it just lights you up. And I think another place where it's really obvious is when you meet someone that you really just, you know, zing with basically, um, yeah. or have that spark or whatever. And that's really rare. I think there's probably, you know, a handful of, let's just for the sake of conversations in a romantic context, women that I've met throughout my life, maybe four or five, where you just feel like there's this energetic relationship that's just very different than anything else. And it gives you more energy. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, that's why you can stay up all night. You can text and you don't need coffee or, you know, it's like, how can I do this? You know, you and, it, and really it's because you do have more energy. And what he said, which I think is fascinating, is everything is seeking more life force energy. So when he told me that, what I really went back learning and really applying, I've, I've gone, I've used my, my business as a Petri dish. Anybody that's around me, you can ask anyone in my company. I practice these principles all the time. We have words like, are we in struggle or are we in easy flow? Is this turning us on? Is this resonant? Is it not? Because what we know is if we can keep ourselves in a state of resonance, that our business grows. And we're not doing it because of that. We're doing it because we have a good time. What I tell my employees is I want you to have a good time here. And I want you to grow within your personal, within your person 
as well as you grow within your career. You know, there's a couple of things going on here. So I know if we're doing those projects that seem outlandish, but they feel really good. You know, it's like, let's do it. Let's go for it. If we're all turned on and it, if it doesn't work, it's fine. I just say you have to win more than you lose, but at least we get that juice in the company, you know? Yeah, definitely. You know, I've always said that on our business cards under the title entrepreneur should be, you know, professional problem solver, quote unquote. Yeah. (laughs) Um, How do you know the difference between a challenge that you're running into in the business that's difficult versus seeing it as, okay, this is just the wrong path as a whole and I need to make a significant change? Yeah, I think it has to do with the energy level and going back to why we're doing things. For example, we just did last year, we just launched this auto unit. We were worried about a competitor and we were, you know, trying to meet this deadline and it just things weren't working out. I mean, over and over and over, we're literally, I had to send my VP of ops for three months over to China to try to get to work. And I knew it. I kept saying, guys, we're in struggle. I know, but competition, you know, so then you get a little fear involved. It ends up, I probably lost a couple million dollars last year. Well, more than that, if you really look at the time and energy. Yeah. That was just, actually, it was probably more than a couple million. But anyway, we won't go into all that. Um, Quite a few millions of dollars. But we knew all along that we were in struggle. And there's a difference when, for example, if we're all turned on and we're doing a video shoot. And, you know, you can't quite seem to let let me go back and see if I can give you a a better example of how that is. You know, by the feeling in your body. That's it. You know, by the feeling, you know why you're doing things. Okay, for example, with that auto unit, we knew we were doing it based on fear. Right. We, We thought it was a good business move. We knew that we were in struggle. You know, I say that the universe was putting all kinds of blocks for us to slow down and watch what we were doing. And we kept overriding that. And it just didn't work. Now we're going to have to go back and re-engineer it. And, you know, there's lots of complications that have gone on with it. But I can't sit around and cry about it because we knew the risk we were taking. It was like, yeah, this probably is not going to work out based on the way we are. But we kept we kept for some reason pushing forward. When something is in flow, problems are solved more easily. Okay. It's like there's always problems in business and you are professional problem solvers. But you don't just get whacked over your head time after time after time, where literally it's like roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. That's when I start going, hold on. And it's not that I abandon it, for example, like the beginning of our Skype call today, but it is for me to slow down and go, hold on, what's going on? You know, what's really going on here? And with the with with that auto unit, I knew time after time we were in struggle. And that's what I call it. It's just too hard. For me, business is not hard. Do I have to put effort and energy in it? Yes. And are there long, tired days? Yes. But it's different than feeling like I'm literally grading against nails. Now, here's the thing. That doesn't mean, you know, we've got all kinds of people that are out there preaching, just push through, make it happen. You can make things happen. It's just not the way I prefer to live anymore. Right. So, and, and, and what I found is, that's another thing when I was talking to Dr. Lipton, I said, what I found is if it's only contrived with my logical mind, right, that it seems like everything has to be perfect. And he said, yeah, it's like a math equation that if you have this plan, you have to pull this plan off exactly in order for it to happen. There's more resiliency I've found in this alive idea. So for, and he also said that a cell is either protecting, it's in protection mode or it's in growth mode. So do you see what happened with the auto unit? We were afraid of competitors. We were trying to rush it to market. We were operating out of protection, right? Mm. Not, not out of growth. And what he said about a cell is a cell, and I'm, and I just actually use this. This is just what happens in biology. I just happen to go, huh, that's kind of like what happens to me in business. He said a cell can't be in both of those at the same time. It can't be in protection and growth. Right. So, for example, look at large corporations, right? You know, I know that a lot of the big corporations, they're looking for 2 to 3% growth because it's old family money, Right. That's all they're looking for. They are mostly in protection mode. So everything is very calculated and it's very diligent. And that is absolutely one way of doing business. 
it's just, it's not alive for me. You know, I prefer to be, you know, uh, doing things that actually make me happy and turn me on and we're all excited about. And generally speaking, they mostly work out for us. That's a perfect segue into into the start or the you know the big launch of your business and how how your growth has taken off. But before we get into that story, I wanted to ask you because I always find this part of an entrepreneur's journey fascinating when it goes idea to concept, especially with physical products, to your first set of inventory. Because unless you come from that field, there's such a search that is involved. Uh, you know, we've had some entrepreneurs on the show here who've started, you know, energy drink companies and, and uh, you know, Fit Aid and, and different companies like that, where I'm like, where did you go to get your first cans filled and the formula made? Because you don't come from the beverage industry. And you have a fairly similar story. So I believe you really did a lot of experimentation at home and, and you came up with these initial formulas. But when did you have to make your first inventory purchase and pick out the bottles and design the label? And what did that process look like? Yeah, um, I appreciate that. And, you know, normally I always tell people, I'm like, you know, this is in the weeds. I don't get too much in the weeds mm. um, because I believe that if you have an alive idea, it's just like having a child. You're going to figure out how to feed it, you know? So I created the formula. I then just, I didn't know what to do. I've never been in this business. I've never made a product before. You know, I, I, like I said, you know, I sold stuff out of my trunk, but I never had an actual CPG company. And I literally just called people and I called a manufacturer. I just picked up the phone and I said, you know, liquid manufacturer. And I called them and said, Hey, I have this product that I invented. Can you help me? And they're like, no, we don't do that. Okay, do you know who does? Yeah, this. Maybe this person. I call that person. And I literally just kept finding my way until I found a manufacturer that says, oh, yeah, we can help you. But that's what I often tell people is you don't really need to know that much. In my experience, people get caught up on that. How do I go from here to there? How do I go from here to there? And they want me to tell them. And you know what I tell them? When I tell you how to go from here to there, then you're going to have to ask me where to go to the next step. So what I'd rather teach people is that you can figure it out and do it. So the advice I have there and what I did is I just told the truth. I've never done this before. I need help. Will you help me? Mm. And people and people helped. So I got a manufacturer and I said, what do I need to do? There's like, you need to get a bottle. Where do I get a bottle? Well, you can buy them from these different sources. I find a source. I buy a few bottles. And then I thought, oh, I need a logo. Okay, great. I hire an artist and said, I need a logo. I see this old Victorian label, perfume label from, you know, well, from like 1920. And I'm like, or I think it was 1890. And I was like, oh, I like this. Can you make it look kind of like this? He goes, yeah. So he makes me a logo. But I, I would go to Starbucks and I would ask people, which bottle do you like? Which label do you like? Which this? And they say, what is that? So it doesn't matter. Just show me which one you like. <laughs> and they would point. So I was doing focus groups. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was literally going, these people can afford a $5 cup of coffee. They can afford to buy this. It kind of made sense to me. But I literally, I didn't know anything. I didn't have anyone to tell me. I had no experts, but I literally just asked for help. What people always ask me, what one piece of advice would you give to a new entrepreneur? I would actually give two. Make something that's so great people want to talk about it. Don't stop when it's good. Nobody talks about good. Okay. You know, did you go to that restaurant yesterday? Yeah. How was it? Good. Okay. Well, I'm not going to go to that. Right. How, how was the restaurant? It was great. I had this appetite. Okay. Good. I'm going to go to that restaurant. So that's the first piece of advice. The second I adv advice I have is ask people for help. In my experience, people want to help you. And there's so many people now that I see them. They're like, do you remember you called me, you know, back in the day and you were looking for labels and I sent you here? Like they really take pride in that is, is my experience. So I, I think you need to know way less than you think you need to know. And I think you just need to reach out for help more. Yeah, agreed. We've got a whole class we've, we've taught on that, which is the you know, four most valuable uh, words you could ever say, which is I need your help. <laughs> so, that's it and and it's yeah. amazing and you don't even just start somewhere yep. you know and, and you pick up the phone and they go you know i said okay you don't do that but i need your help do you know somebody who does i've literally had i used to have people say i i don't know but you know what bob in our office might let me call you back and people will call you back like they want to help you so 
Cooper Eaton kind of grew organically for, for quite a few years. I remember you, you got to a point where you guys were doing about $8 million a year in revenue. Life was good. Life is easy. You know, all things considered. And all of a sudden, you had an idea for uh, a commercial, right? Or video that kind of changed everything. <laughs> what was the story behind that? I just, I, I felt a little, you know, a, people started competing with me, you know, at the gift market, you know, a little, you know, they started knocking me off a little bit. Mm. And, and, and also had this kind of impulse, like, we got to get going here. And it's funny when you read, I'm sure you've read um, Clayton Christensen's Innovator's Dilemma. I only read it a few years ago. Mm. And I was like, that's exactly what I did. He says, you know, at the beginning of innovation that you have to be patient for growth and impatient for profit. And then when Me Too start coming out, that's when that flips. And that's exactly what I did, but I did it intuitively. But I started noticing that people were coming out and I was like, I got to get my skates on. Like, it's time. And just so you know, because I'd filed bankruptcy twice, I have never had a loan. I'm debt free and I have zero investors. So what I was doing was really stockpiling cash for quite a few years. So I would put almost everything I made back into the company. So my company was, you know, really healthy financially by the time I got ready to put the gas on. And I I knew I couldn't afford TV advertising. So I just, it was again, synchronicity. I saw this ad and I was like, oh, that's really clever. I started looking at digital marketing and I found some guys and produced that, that first video. And, you know, it was funny because, you know, they kept telling me this is not going to be a viral video. Viral videos don't happen with consumer goods products. You know, and I'm like, okay, got it. And of course, I think it was two days. I need to look back at the facts, but it was like within a couple of days, we were completely sold out of all the inventory and $4 million in back order. Yeah, it, it was <laughs> clearly it was a, a, as good it as it gets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in a good was, way and it, a bad way. Yeah, it was. Well, the reason it was a nightmare is because my purchasing guy had at the time, our sprayers have like a 12 week lead time. And um, hadn't ordered any sprayers. And uh, the sprayer manufacturer was going through an SAP conversion. And there's a really special sprayer that I use that not everybody has. So I wasn't going to be able to ship people for almost six months. Wow. Yeah, I was really super panicked. I was trying to find these sprayers everywhere. I mean, I'm calling everywhere. In the world. I spent two weeks of really panic, you know. And I, I, I couldn't do it. I finally emailed all of our customers. And of course, in our poopery, clever way, um, you know, I was like, we got caught with our pants down. You're not going to get product for at least four months. I'll send you back all of your money. And I think we had one person that won their money back out of the, you know, thousands Hundreds of thousands, of thousands yeah. Yeah, yeah, of orders, which was really great. People love the transparency. You know, now people talk about transparency. It's like, I have to do it. You know, I need to tell these people what happened. But what happened is I was in a real uh, problem and I, I really felt I was going to lose my company. You know, all those fears come in, you know, oh, this is when competition can come over. They can take you over. Blah, blah, blah. And I woke, I wasn't sleeping and I got up one morning at about 3 a.m. and I started meditating and I went, I just, I just came out of that. And I, I linked in message, the CEO of the sprayer manufacturer. And I said, I know that your, your team has told me no for two weeks now. But I'm going to fly to your corporate offices. First, I'm going to get, I'm buying a ticket. I'm going, to, I'm going to take the first flight out. And I have 48 hours before I have to be at a trade show. And I'm going to sit in your offices. And I don't care even if you give me five minutes. But I want you to look me in the eye. And I want you to know and tell me that you can't help my company because I'm going down. And I booked the ticket, LinkedIn messaging back and said, I'm on my way. I'll be at your corporate offices, you know, by 11 a.m., I'm prepared to spend 48 hours sitting on a couch right there in your office, however close I can get. And I got a call when I was at the airport and they ended up, I mean, a very you know tearful, tearful call. They ended up going to the board and they ended up seeding me 200,000 sprayers a week uh, just to keep me alive. And they took it from one of the big manufacturers, we won't say, or big uh, companies in the world, we won't say who, mm. but they ended up keeping me alive. Um, it was just a fun story of me going back to my intuition, right? Because I tried all my external sources. That's the theme of my life is me going outside thinking somebody's going to save me and then coming back into myself going, oh, hold on. I just want to look at this guy and I want him to tell me, you know, in, in there, we were like a piece of dirt on, you know, out in a, a 
you know, we're like a piece of sand in the beach compared to, you know, the size yeah. of companies they work, they work with. Um, but I knew that over email is different when then when you sit there and look at someone and you're making that conscious choice, like I know this woman's going to lose her company and I'm okay with that. It's right. like, that's fine. Fair enough. But I want you to do that. So that's a really fun story. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. And I, I'm obviously, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they're glad they made that decision today. So, um, yeah. And yeah. they did. And, and they're wonderful, but they literally saved my company. I'm really interested in how y'all came up with the concept for the, the commercial, the viral video, How to Poop at a Party, right? I mean, what a clever, clever title. The, the costuming, the setting, everything's just amazing. Is, is that all you? Is that a team effort? Is that the, the marketing team that you hired? But where did the, the ideation come from for the concept? Well, that's one of our viral videos. Our first viral video you were speaking to earlier was Girls Don't Poop. Ah, that's right. Yeah, um, yeah and that was with an outside agency, but it was, it was us, us with an outside agency. So um, we, for that video, for Girls Don't Poop, we, um, I camped out and I rented a, literally a, a huge house and we sat in it for two weeks. We wrote the script. We cast for the video. We built the website, everything. We just brought all developers in. I love doing these. Um, I think now Google or someone calls it Sprint. I just got a book called Sprint. Of course, I didn't know what it was, but that's kind of what I did. You know, bring everybody together, do these really um, intensive powwows. And we came out with that viral video, but um, we do everything in-house now. So how to poop at a party comes from all internally. We have an idea that cracks us up. You know, it, it feels alive to all of us. We all feel excited. You know, you can feel the energy in the room and we start moving towards it, you know, in that we hire, you know, we hire an outside, usually outside producer and those producers help source, you know, the, you know, they, they cast and we're, we're there with everything. You know, we look at the casting, we hire someone to do wardrobe um, we hire a set designer, but we, we give them you know, we build mood boards and kind of say, here's what we're looking at. And then, you know, we work very much hand in hand. We have basically our own internal agency. That's what we, we do. We, we write our own, we write all of our material. We direct it all. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Love it. How has your life changed personally now that you've, you've reached the level of success that you're at from a, from a passions perspective? Um, I don't, you know, I don't know if you've gotten into philanthropy at all or if any other kind of topic outside of the business has really taken a hold um, and become a priority for you or not. Yeah, what's really starting to be a priority, you know, my, my prayer has been for, since I've had Pooperia, show me what all of this is for. And we mm. do, we, we have, you know, lots of things that we do, you know, for, for, for people. Um, I don't get into that so much because it's not a major thing that we tout. That's just what we do from a personal level. But what I've really found is I've been doing a lot of speaking. And what I've, what I realized is that my story, because the trajectory, Mike, is so intense, that my story really helps um, inspire other people, no matter where you're at. I have so many people, you know, I had a friend just the other day say, I haven't told you this. I'm almost near bankruptcy. What do you do? I'm like, don't file bankruptcy. There's a lot of bad karma, you know, go to a, go to a financial person and get some advice. So there's a lot of really information that I can guide to people because my story has so many, um, so much of what I call dysfunction, you know, to it, that no matter where you're at, I, I kind of look at go, you can get yourself out. You know, so so for that person that was 19 that had no idea and tried to kill themselves when they're 21 because they couldn't figure it out. Now, what I want to do is really tell people like you have everything inside of you to figure this out and you have everything inside of you to, to, to be successful. Like you really, really do. It's just are you willing to clear and move towards things for the right reason? You know, not just because it's popular or somebody says you should do it or your mentor says, but is it something that's inside of you that really turns you on? And I've had so many people making so many shifts in their life and it just really touches me. And that's what I want to do more and more because the story doesn't make sense any otherwise. You know, I don't want to be known as an entrepreneur. It's like, yeah, I've made a lot of money, but that's not the point at all. The point is, is I'm freaking happy. 
with or without money. <laughs> right, right. You know, it's so interesting. The, the two most successful businesses that I've built had that moment of inspiration and just energy. And it's like, oh, I can see it and I want to make that and build it. And they were very, very successful. The other businesses that I've started with a different objective, maybe, you know, I want to build something that I, a company that I can sell or, you know, have it be acquired or whatever, where I had this, this different goal that didn't come from that type of inspiration. None of those ever worked out. No. And, but it's, it's interesting though, that you can't force the inspiration side of it. And so what, what advice do you have? Because I think you mentioned earlier, like you, you kind of just sat with it for about four years before that strike, you know, lightning strike hit you. What do you do in the meantime? <laughs> you know, if someone's wanting to start a business and become an entrepreneur, they haven't had that zing moment. What do they do? Yeah, I would do a lot of clearing. So I would spend time in therapy, you know, do EMDR, you know, hypnosis. I would, whether it, you might have a Christian practice, you know, I would do a lot of prayer. If you meditate, I would meditate. And I really, do tell people just stop doing as much. Yes, go to work, but really try to create space. Mm. Because what I found, the more space I have, the more creative ideas can come in. If you look at most people's lives, they don't have the space for a creative idea to even come in, right? Right. And there also may be a block that they're not even creative. So I say, first of all, you need to create some kind of space. Just stop going to dinner with all your friends for, a, you know, a year or as much, you know, cut back your social life by 50 percent and really sit and sit. And just I just did this at Christmas. I didn't want to buy my kids anything for Christmas. And I sat for an entire weekend and I sat. And finally, at the end of the weekend, I came up with this incredible idea that will be a new business. <laughs> But I just laugh because I literally was like, I'm just going to sit and I'm going to wait and I'm going to sit for an idea to come through. But most of us don't take that time to just stop so that the idea, remember the idea with how to solve the problem with the sprayers. I went into meditation. I just sat. So I say just stop as much as possible, which seems so counterintuitive because you want to keep running. Have you gone down the, the plant medicine route at all? A lot. <laughs> oh, awesome. Would you be willing to share? Yeah, of course. So that's another thing that I did. Even when I was building my business, when I first started, I sent my son down to Peru. He was having a hard time. This was 12 years ago. And sent him down. He came back from the jungle, you know, really uh, completely, you know, 180. And I just said, what is this? So I started going down to Peru. So what I would do is I would work in my business and I would go down and you know, be in the jungle for two weeks studying with shamans. And my first 35 ceremonies were hellacious. I mean, you know, that was the first 35. Yeah, they were. And I I know that because we would do five. I went down there seven times and we'd do these five chunks, you know, five ceremonies at a time. And my husband at the time kept saying, why do you keep doing this? And because, you know, it's lots of throwing up and facing, you know, your deepest, darkest things. And I said, because each time I feel like I'm pulling a piece of myself back. So I would go down to the jungle for two weeks. I would come back, you know, and tell all my employees what happened. And I, I bounced, I, I bounced back and forth. And I remember one day I was sitting at my desk and some big, scary thing happened in the world, business world that you think is scary. You know, who knows what it was? Um, I don't even remember now it's how unimportant it is. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I'm in ceremony. Because down in the jungle, I would go in these ceremonies where I would drink ayahuasca. And for four to six hours, I would battle, you know, whatever it was. And then I would find some resolution. And I realized there's no difference in being in the jungle in ceremony and being in life in ceremony. So life is one big ass ceremony, right? Mm -hmm. It's how do we deal with it? How can we see that it's for us and how can we progress forward? So that's when I really started running my business from what I call the inside out. Like I was like, oh, when I clear up what's going on inside of me, my external world is really shifting drastically. And so anytime anything happens in business, like I'm talking like I went through four COOs and I was like, am I just I can't hire people, right? I obviously can't hire people. And I'd gone through like four assistants at the same time. 
And I was like, what's going on? And then I realized, oh, my first memory was cooking for my parents at four years old. I have a problem with support. So I went into EMDR and therapy, you know, just looking at support. Now I have, you know, an incredible president, an incredible senior VP of ops, like literally all that shifted. What I realized is I was hiring within the goggles of that past trauma. Yeah. So that's the way I choose to handle business because for me, I grow either way. It's like, okay, yeah, my business is growing, but I'm growing internally as well. And I learned that from the medicine. Um, and I've drank ayahuasca, I don't know, like 90 something times, but um, over 12 years. But what I really like about the medicine, if anyone's called to it, I say, yeah, do it. If you're called, if you're not, no, why would you do that? But what I know is that your, your world, you operate from your subconscious mind. So I'm a big proponent and do anything you can to sub, if you don't, if you have a pattern you don't like, then go to your subconscious mind and shift it, whether it's EMDR, hypnosis, ayahuasca, you know, I, however you shift it, just, just shift it because it's like a hard drive on your computer is just got a jacked up, you know, little flaw in it. Yeah, no, that's been, that's been, um, the rabbit hole I've jumped down the last probably nine months, um, oh. where it finally, uh, it finally went through, it occurred to me that, hey, these are patterns that are repeating, they're subconscious, it's shit from when I was a little kid, and I'm, I've repeated them enough now to identify and become aware of them, so... And it's pretty yeah. neat that we've got, we've just got this growing group of entrepreneurs who are all around the same age. We're all between 35 and 45, various, you know, various levels of success that have all kind of discovered this over the last couple of years. And specifically in the last year, there's a whole community that's formed in Austin mm -hmm. of high level performers and business owners who've achieved the success that they have running away from the shit that traumatized them as a child and they're mm -hmm. now hitting around 40 and having okay this isn't really serving me anymore yeah so yeah i just did my second mdma uh session last week and the first one was life-changing yeah like, absolutely life-changing so did the second one last week which was extremely informative not quite the same level of impact or like you know just light bulb moment but yeah, there's been a lot of uh, hypnotherapy as well. I tried a couple of months ago. I've been through five sessions of that. That was absolutely unbelievable because I didn't have any expectations for it. It's like hypnotherapy, eh, is this real? Is it not? I don't know. But a friend went through it, introduced me to the person who guided him through those sessions. And they were just as powerful as the plant medicine ceremonies. Yeah. So I'm super stoked about it. And this is something we'll be talking about a lot. But uh, that's really that's cool. Well, I appreciate that you're doing it. You know, I just did it because I, you know, it was like, I, I got to get out of pain, right? I want to shift my life. And I was that, you know, desperate to do it. It's like, I'm not going back there no matter what happens. It, you know, I think the medicine is incredible. It's really incredible to get you out of your comfort zone. What I realized is I kind of developed some sort of agency from doing it so much. Because, you know, like I said, I got my ass kicked the first 35. Then I started realizing like, oh, hold on. I actually can kind of keep my wits about me while I'm journeying in this mess. <laughs> and that's the same way in life. You know, can I actually uh, maintain my composure no matter what, what goes on in life? So I think that these teachers are here. It's really fascinating to watch because that was, I was 12 or 13 years ago. Uh, let's see, my son's, he was 19, he's 31. So it's 12 years ago. And watching how much the medicine has come into the world in the past 12 years is radical. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, some of my friends here are about to get approval to open the first uh, federally approved MDMA office here in Austin in the next 12 months. Really? Yeah, they'll have the first two nationally FDA approved therapists that will be able to do it legally uh, wow. for folks. So yeah. I would love to have more information about that. That is fabulous. And I just say that here's the deal. You know, we if you want to shift and if you really want to change, and I'm talking about real change, like you have to do things like that, you know, because those traumas just don't go away. You can't sugarcoat them. And at some point they're going to surface. You know, I would prefer to uh, proactively go after them now.
Yeah. I mean, gosh, if I'd gone through this 10 years ago, it would have been a totally different, <laughs> a totally different decade. Would um, it? Yeah. Well, well, that's, con- congratulations that's really cool. on doing that. It, it takes a lot of courage. Um, people say that, you know, like it's very courageous, yet you're like, well, I got to, right? It's, it's just interesting because I haven't met anyone who's gone, th- you know, and quote unquote, done the work that's come out and regretted it or, or been worse. Like everybody who's gone through it has been like, fuck, why didn't I do this years ago? Yeah. Um, you know, so. That, no, that's yeah. it. And that's what you think. Yeah. But I love, I love that people are waking up sooner, you know, cause it used to be, you know, I, I always say that life's either, you're either going to do it or life's going to give it to you at some point. Hopefully we have some sort of awakening, right. To, to our own patterns and what we're up to. You might as well like start doing this stuff now. So yeah. if yeah. you're young and you're out there, like get on it. I've told my kids I, that we have a standing thing that I will pay for any therapy and any healing work that they have for the rest of their life. Like that's it. You know, I don't give them money any otherwise, yeah. but I will absolutely do that. And they all do their work. That's I'm awesome. so excited. Yeah. I'm like, Let's get cool. started, get started now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Susie, thank you so much. Uh, I want to be respectful of your time today, but this is awesome. And I, if you don't mind, I'm going to introduce you to a couple of my friends here in town who are doing awesome stuff with the plant medicine uh, oh. world and, and see if you guys can connect because there's going to be some synergy there somewhere. So, Oh, I would love awesome. it. I would love it. And I also have a lot of people that ask me all the time, so it'd be good to have people to refer yeah. um, places as well. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you again. This was a real pleasure. I would love to connect when you're when you're in Austin next time. Maybe at South Bio, we'll come, uh, we'll come see you speak. But um, this was great. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your you time bet. and you having me on. Absolutely. Okay. Well, guys, gals, as always, thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next week. Take care. Falling in more times than I can get out.